Hello and welcome. We are live from New Delhi. You're watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Abhishek. Coming up in the next talk. Baltimore divers recover two bodies from harbour after bridge collapse. Investigators say it will take 12 to 24 months to probe the incident. India once again underlines the importance of two-state solution. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar says there is underlying issue of right of Palestinians to a homeland. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba in India on a two-day official visit. Ahead of the visit, Kuleba welcomes Indian participation in reconstruction of Ukraine. And nominations for the second phase of India's general elections 2024 to begin today. 88 parliamentary constituencies will go to polls on April 26th. The investigation team into the cargo ship crash in Baltimore has recovered two bodies from harbour. Addressing media on the aftermath of the collision, an investigation team of the National Transportation Safety Board has said that the probe will take 12 to 24 months. The NTSB has to focus on data that we are able to validate as part of our investigation. Um, the public, the world, uh, relies on us to be independent, thorough, fact-based, and it is meticulous work. Uh, but because we do that, we get to the right solutions as part of our investigation. Uh, we are very careful not to jump to conclusions, to speculate, uh, and so it's helpful to have. Uh, but what's really helpful is the information that we are able to validate uh, and that takes time and that will lead us uh, to the findings, probable cause and safety recommendations that will issue. National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Humendi said that some containers were carrying hazardous materials. The containers of hazardous materials, the total of 56 containers, were there, uh, was, were those contents on what, what was in the actual breached uh, containers? We'll have to provide you more information on that. But in total, it was a number of corrosives, uh, a number of flammable materials, uh, and uh, we have uh, some miscellaneous, they fall under what is class 9, which is miscellaneous trans, uh, hazardous materials, which w is where the lithium-ion batteries would, would be. And the National Transportation Safety Board has interviewed the ship's captain, his mate, the chief engineer and other two pilots on board the Dali at the time of collision will be interviewed on Friday. Moving on to our next story now, the U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said that no threat to the public from any materials on board the freight ship that struck a heavily trafficked Baltimore bridge early Tuesday morning, causing it to collapse. He also said that they are concerned about the local economic impact with some 8,000 jobs directly associated with port activities. We are concerned about the local economic impact with some 8,000 jobs directly associated with port activities. And we are concerned about implications that will ripple out beyond the immediate region because of the roles, uh, the, excuse me, because of the port's role in our supply chains. This is an important port for both imports and exports, and it's America's largest vehicle handling port, which is important not only for car imports and exports, but also for farm equipment. And the analysts are warning the economic impact of a down bridge in the U.S. city of Baltimore could be felt across the globe, with some suggesting it may lead to a temporary increase in the price of coal in India as U.S. producers are forced to find new shipping routes. India was by far the largest destination for U.S. coal shipments in 2023, with 11.8 million tons delivered there 
accounting for 36.3% of total U.S. thermal exports. On Wednesday, U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said rebuilding Francis Scott Key Bridge will not be quick or easy. DD India correspondent Sally Patterson reports. This 2.5-kilometre bridge turned to rubble in moments. The cargo ship, which collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in the US city of Baltimore, still trapped in a tangle of metal. Recovery efforts remain underway, but the outlook is bleak. The six missing construction workers on the bridge at the time are all presumed dead. So I had woken up and um, it, had, it had felt like an earthquake and we heard like the loud boom from the, uh, from the bridge being, you know, collapsed. For resident Molly and her dog Moo, there's a gaping hole in the view from their backyard. Gaps too, at least in the short term, for the 15,000 strong workforce who depend on the bridge and the port. But there could also be global ramifications. Millions of tons and billions of dollars worth of cargo pass through here each year. As you can see, trucks can still come in and out by road, but because of the collapsed bridge, nothing is able to come in or out by sea. And that means a pause, at least for now, on cargo coming into the port of Baltimore. Baltimore is crucial to the movement of cars, construction machinery and coal, meaning the blockage here could also see a spike in the cost of goods, even if only temporarily. Exports of coal are, are quite important. That actually uh, could have an effect, particularly in India, actually, where we export a lot of our coal to. So all of that basically because of the port being shut down means that that trade and the movement of certain commodities is disrupted and that eventually can flow into higher prices. Some businesses which rely on this route are scrambling to deal with the extra costs and logistical headaches. Those people who own the freight in uh, those containers are going to have to pay more for their transportation. Um, they're going to have to pay more to get the, the container from uh, you know, somewhere that's 100, 300, 500, 1,000 miles away from where it's normally supposed to, to go. The National Transportation Safety Board is investigating what took place that night. And the Biden administration has pledged to shoulder the cost of reconstructing the bridge. I told them we're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. But it will likely take several years and hundreds of millions of dollars before this vital trade artery flows healthily again. Sally Patterson in Baltimore reporting for DD India. And US President Joe Biden held a meeting with the officials concerned with the bridge collision in Baltimore. US President Biden discussed the coordinated response to the collapse of the bridge with Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg and Vice Admiral Gautier. During the meeting, Biden reiterated its commitment to be with the people of Baltimore for as long as it takes. Now, India once again underlined the importance of two-state solution to address the Israel-Palestine conflict. Interacting with the Indian community in Malaysia, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar said that a response to the ongoing conflict in the Gaza has to acknowledge the fact that the Palestinian people were denied the right to their homeland. On the one hand, what happened on October 7th was terrorism. On the other hand, nobody would, uh, you know, countenance the deaths of innocent civilians. Countries may be, uh, may be uh, justified, at least in their own minds, in responding. But you cannot have a response which does not uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, every response must take into account something called international humanitarian law. And the fact is that whatever the rights and wrongs of the issue, there is the underlying issue of the rights of the Palestinians and the fact that they have been denied their homeland. Now, Israel has asked the White House to reschedule a high-level meeting on military plans for Gaza's southern city of Rafah that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had abruptly cancelled. Netanyahu called for a planned visit to Washington by a senior Israeli delegation after the U.S. allowed passage of a Gaza ceasefire resolution at the United Nations on March 25th.
The Prime Minister's office uh, has agreed, has agreed uh, to reschedule the meeting dedicated to Rafa. So we're, we're uh, now working uh, with them to set, to find a convenient date uh, that's obviously going to work for both sides. But he, his office has agreed uh, to, uh, to reschedule that meeting that would be dedicated uh, to Rafa, which is a good thing. Now the U.S. said it does not believe that hostage talks with Israel and Hamas are over. In a regular media briefing on Wednesday, State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said that Washington believes there is an opportunity to continue pursuing the release of hostages. Listen in. The hostage negotiations we do not believe are over. We do not believe they've come to an end. Uh, we believe that there is uh, an ability to, con to continue to pursue uh, the release of hostages, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Meanwhile, Spain on Wednesday delivered 26 tons of humanitarian aid to Gaza by airdropping it over the Strip. The operation carried out in coordination with Jordan and co-financed by the European Union involved two Airbus A400 military planes dropping over 11,000 food packets. Footage released by the Spanish Foreign Ministry showed crates of supplies leaving an aircraft ramp and heading towards the ground via parachutes. No migrants travelling through the southern Mexican state of Chiapas said on Wednesday they distrusted the Mexican authorities' offer of money in exchange for returning migrants to their home countries. Last week, the Mexican government said it would give Venezuelan migrants in the country around $110 a month, part of a program in which they will also have the opportunity to work for different companies in both the countries. But migrants in the caravan feared that this was only a ploy from the government to incarcerate people before deporting them back without any payments. Now, Puerto Rico declared a public health emergency on Wednesday following a significant increase in the number of dengue cases on the island. According to the island's health department, at least 549 cases have been reported so far and more than 340 people have been hospitalized. Chief Medical Officer at Puerto Rico's Department of Health says that if these numbers continue to rise, the island's health system could be compromised. Authorities on the island have carried out numerous spraying operations to mitigate the number of mosquitoes and the situation is being monitored. Now, Ohtani Mania officially kicked off in downtown Los Angeles on Wednesday with the unveiling of a 15-storey mural of new Dodger star Shohi Ohtani. Boyle Heights artist Robert Vargas created the mural depicting the Japanese sensation in his new Dodger uniform in a pair of images, one swinging a bat and another pitching, highlighting the talents of the offensive and defensive standout. Fans wearing Ohtani clothes and merchandise posed for photos in front of the mural and gazed up at the gigantic tribute to their favourite player. All right, we'll slip into a very short break, but still to come on this edition of DD India News Hour. European Union ambassadors have been meeting to try and make progress on proposed relief measures for farmers as anger against the bloc's policies continues to fuel protest. Myanmar junta chief calls for unity. Junta chief says military holding power temporarily. And we'll give you an update on Senegal presidential elections. In a world that never stops, where information shapes our reality, one app stands out, helps you stay ahead of time. Introducing the DD India app, your gateway to a world of news right at your fingertips. Your most trusted source of news goes global, goes digital. Explore a world of options, top stories, live updates, in-depth analysis and more. Stay informed wherever you are. Real-time alerts keep you ahead of the curve always. The DD India app connecting you to the world one story at a time. Download now and explore the world of knowledge, insights and authentic information. Wherever news breaks, whatever it takes.
Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs, with a fusion of aesthetics and substance. Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. Back you watching DD India News R. I'm Abhishek Mahajan. European Union ambassadors have been trying to try and make progress on proposed relief measures for farmers as anger against the bloc's policies continues to fuel protest. Six. European farmers say their profits have been hit by the bloc's sustainability norms and trade policies. DD India's Ishan Karg has more from Brussels. European agriculture ministers have decided to cut down on the bureaucratic burden on farmers. It was one of the biggest demands by the farming groups who have criticized the EU for excessive red tape. So EU ambassadors met in Brussels on Wednesday to continue technical discussions around how the proposed measures could potentially work. They also discussed scrutinizing farming imports into the single market. However, any decision on capping imports is yet to be taken. Many farmers are protesting against cheaper Ukrainian agricultural imports, saying it could hurt the bloc's agrarian sector. They see the situation could worsen if the EU finalizes its free trade agreements, especially the ones it's currently working on with Latin American countries. European farmers are worried that imports from agricultural giants such as Brazil and Argentina will make them uncompetitive. Earlier this week, they blocked streets here in Brussels, the administrative capital of the European Union in dissent. The EU agriculture ministers had earlier agreed to water down some environmental norms to help farmers. They also set up a mechanism to monitor the prices of agricultural goods in the bloc. So we can observe the stabilization of, of prices in uh, cereals market. Uh, no, of course, we are not happy about the and farmers are not happy about the level of prices, uh, but we can observe um, some signs of stabilization. Farming groups are now demanding a new law that prohibits the sale of their produce below the cost of production. This demand could be on the agenda when EU heads of state meet for a special summit later in April. Countries led by France and Poland are also likely to discuss cutting imports from Ukraine. They are hoping to quell farmers' anger soon, as there are concerns it could be capitalized on by far-right groups in the upcoming European Parliament elections. And though European farmers are among the most subsidized in the world, many say the aid mainly benefits big farmers. Ashan Gerg in Brussels, reporting for DD India. And the United States on Wednesday announced sanctions on six individuals and two entities based in Russia, China and the United Arab Emirates, accusing them of channeling funds to North Korea's weapons programs. South Korea, U.S. ally also imposed sanctions on four of the same six individuals and the two entities. A U.S. Treasury Department statement and South Korea's foreign ministry said that the action was taken in coordination between the two countries. The entities to be hit with sanctions were Alice LLC based in Vladivostok, Russia, and UAE-based pioneer Star Real Estate. The statement said both firms were subordinate to Ching Yong Information Technology Corporation, an entity associated with North Korea's armed forces. A delegation of Russia's External Intelligence Bureau visited the North Korean capital of Pyongyang between Monday and Wednesday and discussed boosting cooperation against spying. During the visit, officials of the Intelligence Bureau and the Ministry held working-level talks. The two sides discussed further boosting cooperation and briefed each other on the international and regional situation regarding the Korean Peninsula and Russia.
Now, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky visited on Wednesday fortifications in the country's northeastern Sumy region, inspecting trenches, dugouts and firing positions. Ukraine has stepped up construction of fortifications in recent months as it shifts its military operations against Russia to a more defensive footing. Zelensky said earlier Ukraine's defensive constructions needed to be boosted and work on them accelerated in Ukraine's east. During his trip to Sumy region, Zelensky also paid a visit to Ukrainian soldiers treated at the military hospital and awarded the medals. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Dmitry Kuleba, will be arriving in New Delhi on Thursday for a two-day official visit at the invitation of the External Affairs Minister. During his visit, Foreign Minister Kuleba will have a number of engagements including official meetings with External Affairs Minister and Deputy NSA. The discussion will pertain to the bilateral partnership and cooperation on regional and global issues of mutual interest. He is also expected to interact with the business community. Ahead of his visit to India, Ukraine Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba on Wednesday said Ukraine sees India as an important global power. This will be my first visit to the country and the first visit of a Ukrainian foreign minister to India in seven years. The aim of this visit is to strengthen the Ukrainian-Indian relationship. Ukraine sees India as an important global power with a powerful international voice. We are confident that close cooperation will benefit both our nations. Well, our India correspondent Amrit Pal Singh joins us to talk more on this. Uh, good morning, Amrit Pal. Uh, India is a powerful voice when it comes to global peace and India global key uh, key global power, uh, Kuleba said ahead of the visit. Uh, uh, Amdabal, what do you think will be the expectations of Ukrainian side from India uh, as the war between Russia and Ukraine continues to rage? Okay, Abhishek, the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister is going to be here uh, today and tomorrow uh, uh, primarily to seek Indian support and in reconstruction of Ukraine. Hmm. Uh, Ukraine uh, during the war has been devastated a lot. It's looking at uh, uh, you know, uh, global partners and global investors to reconstruct uh, Ukraine. Uh, that's the essential uh, reach out uh, of the, the Ukrainian foreign minister, as he said, that he sees India as a key global power. Um, both uh, President Zelensky and uh, President Putin had a, a telephonic conversation with uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, in this month, uh, where um, Prime Minister Modi had reiterated India's uh, long-standing uh, Stance that uh, you know uh, the way forward is through dialogue and diplomacy and not through military victory. Uh, so India would continue to press uh, that position. Um, the Ukrainians would want to seek uh, you know Indian support in terms of uh, uh, investments, in terms uh, of uh, private participation uh, a, 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 and cooperation in terms uh, a, uh, in areas of agricultural exports. Uh, nuclear safety, uh, 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 you know, uh, trade promotion, uh, also pharmaceuticals. So uh, these are the areas the two sides would want to uh, work on. Uh, India and uh, uh, Ukraine had a robust uh, student exchange program uh, where, where a lot of Indian students uh, went uh, to uh, Ukraine primarily for studies in medical sciences and uh, pursuing uh, uh, their, their MBBS degrees. Uh, which uh, has uh, fallen to a knot after the war broke out in February 22. Uh, Ukraine would want to push India to uh, restart that. Of course, how many Indian students go will depend upon how uh, the war uh, affairs from here or how much uh, peace uh, can be brought uh, in that war-torn uh, country. Hmm. So uh, the Ukrainian foreign minister's push uh, would be on these things. Also, apart from that, he would... Uh, uh, press India to participate in the peace conference that's happening in Switzerland. Uh, both uh, uh, when uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi spoke with President Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky had stressed upon this fact because uh, this uh, peace conference, which is being organized in Switzerland, which India could join uh, 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 virtually, uh, uh, would assen is essentially um, of being organized uh, for uh, raising funds uh, for reconstruction of Ukraine. Amritpal also, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi on March 20th had held separate conversations uh, with Russian President Vladimir Putin and also uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. And he asserted that dialogue and diplomacy were the way forward. Uh, 
in that context, how crucial do you think is the visit? Uh, India has been, uh, you know, consistently saying that, uh, hmm. Abhishek. Uh, if you look at uh, when the war started, uh, he, uh, Prime Minister Modi had uh, had separate uh, discussions uh, with both uh, President Zelensky and uh, uh, President uh, uh, Putin. And he's been consistently saying uh, that, uh, you know, India believes that dialogue and diplomacy is the way forward. Military victory will not uh, lead to any victory for either side. Uh, so uh, that's been, uh, and, and they've been talked about India intervening and India being an intermediary, which India has uh, said that India is ready to do that, provided both sides are ready. So I think uh, when uh, Dimitri uh, Koleba comes here and meets Foreign Minister uh, Jay Shankar, he will be, uh, uh, you know, told the same thing, that uh, India is, uh, believes that the two sides should uh, get down to the table uh, because it's already brought a lot of uh, destruction. Uh, both in Ukraine and in Russia and has affected the world at large uh, in terms of global supply chain disruptions, the energy crisis, uh, etc. And uh, the both sides uh, should uh, sit down to resolve this uh, through dialogue and diplomacy. All right, Amrapal, we'll leave it at that. Thank you for your inputs. The leader of the Myanmar's ruling military on Wednesday said that the junta is holding power temporarily with the aim of strengthening democracy and will forge ahead with plans to hold a fair election. Addressing an annual Armed Forces Day Parade, Senior General Minister Ong Liang said armed groups were trying to derail plans to return power to the people. He said the election for which he provided no time frame would be held under a mixed member proportional representation system that would be more inclusive. The military is facing its biggest challenge since first taking power in the former British colony in 1962 fighting on multiple fronts to contain uprisings in several parts of the country and stabilize an economy that has wilted since the coup. In Senegal's presidential election, opposition candidate Bastiru Diomai Fai won over 54% of votes, with ruling coalition candidate Amadou Ba taking over 35%. The court said the results were based on vote tallies from 100% of polling stations. They are expected to be confirmed by the Constitutional Council in the coming days. In his first public appearance since the vote promised to govern with humility and transparency, both incumbent President Macky Sall and rival Amadou Ba congratulated him, hearing the outcome as a win for Senegal. It would be the first time since independence from France in 1960 that an opponent has won in the first round. The presidents of the France and Brazil on Wednesday launched a submarine built in Brazil with French technology in a program that aims to build Brazil's first nuclear-powered submarine by the end of the decade. President Emmanuel Macron and Louis Nassé Lula da Silva attended a ceremony in the Itaguai shipyard near Rio de Janeiro to launch the third diesel-powered submarine built in a $10 billion partnership. The submarine program began in 2008 during Lula's previous presidential term is a partnership with France's state-run naval group. French President Emmanuel Macron is on a three-day visit to Brazil that aims to relaunch the bilateral relationship and strategic partnership. Macron said during his visit to Brazil that a potential trade agreement between the European Union and the South American Mercosur bloc is a very bad deal and more climate commitment are needed. While Brazil has said it is ready to sign a deal, France has repeatedly expressed reservations and said its farmers have objected to the prospect that could allow in agricultural imports that do not meet strict EU standards. Macron also called for much more direct investment from Brazilian firms into France and said the two countries could cooperate on investing in third markets, notably in Africa. I deeply believe that we need to rethink our trade rules in light of this advantage, which is why I prefer to put my foot down in front of this assembly. I have spoken out very forcefully to say that Mercosur, as it is negotiated today, is a very bad agreement. But I think it's a very bad deal for you and for us. All right, we'll slip in a very short break, but still to come on this edition of DD India News Hour. Campaigning gains momentum for the first phase of India's general elections to be held on April 19th. National Day of Greece celebrated in New Delhi.
and the commander of China Corps visits Rashtriya Rifles troops deployed in the counter-terrorism grid to review the security situation in North Kashmir. Wherever news breaks, whatever it takes. Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs, with a fusion of aesthetics and substance. Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Abhishek Mahajan. Recap of what we have done so far. Baltimore divers recover two bodies from harbor after bridge collapse. Investigators say it will take 12 to 24 months to probe the incident. India once again underlines the importance of two-state solution. External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar says there is underlying issue of right of Palestinians to a homeland. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba in India on a two-day official visit. Ahead of the visit, Kuleba welcomes Indian participation in reconstruction of Ukraine. Nominations for the second phase of India's general elections to begin today. 88 parliamentary constituencies will go to polls on April 26th. Well, let's get to the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic elections. So nominations for the second phase of general elections to India's lower house of parliament 2024 begins on Thursday. A total of 88 constituencies in 13 states and union territories will go to polls in second phase elections. The states union territories that will go to polls in this phase are Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Jammu and Kashmir, Karnataka, Kerala, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Tripura, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal apart from one part of outer Manipur seat. Polling for second phase will take place on 26th April. All right, DD India's Shubhendu Ghosh is joining us to talk more on this. Uh, good morning, Shubhendu. Uh, political fever grips the country and nominations for the phase two of Lok Sabha polls to begin on Thursday. What more can you tell us and highlights of the face? Absolutely. Uh, good morning, uh, Abhishek. Yes, political fever is gripping up. It's time for filing of nominations for the second phase. As you mentioned, uh, the 88 uh, parliamentary constituencies that are uh, for the nomination of which uh, are going to begin from today after the notification by the Election Commission. There is also a seat of Manipur that is going to go to uh, polls in, in, in two parts. So uh, a part of that constituency is also uh, included. You mentioned about the states that are going into uh, uh, the polls in this phase, in the second phase, uh, the 88 constituencies, they spread across the length and breadth of the country. If you look at the north, uh, you have Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, the east, Assam and Bengal are going to the polls. West, you have Rajasthan. Then you have Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh, uh, big states, uh, politically extremely uh, relevant. Kerala, Karnataka in the south. So we see the second phase constituencies are spread uh, uh, across uh, different parts of the country. Uh, we also know that uh, uh, particularly in the states of Uttar Pradesh, Bengal and Bihar, the uh, polling uh, are taking place in seven phases. Those are mm -hmm. uh, critical states in particular. If you look at some of the uh, important constituencies that are going to be uh, going to polls in this phase, in the second phase, where uh, 88 constituencies are going into polls, there is Bhagalpur, 
in uh, Bihar, Srinagar in uh, Jammu and Kashmir, Mysore, Bangalore seats in Karnataka, Vaidnad in uh, Kerala, where uh, the Congress leader Rahul Gandhi uh, is uh, going to be a candidate, Ghazibad uh, in Uttar Pradesh, Gautam Budnagar as well. So uh, hugely uh, significant, this second mm. phase, uh, where 88 uh, constituencies will send their delegates to the parliament. Shubindu also, uh, Congress released its eighth list of candidates yesterday. Uh, BJP also points uh, uh, looks about both in charges. Uh, I mean, uh, political campaigns uh, have started uh, to woo the voters. Summer season is the election season. Absolutely. Uh, the summer season is the election season in India. Congress uh, released its eighth list. Uh, 208 candidates so far have been released uh, by the Congress party, uh, but the BJP has released over 400 uh, candidate names uh, so far. Uh, it is uh, going to be a significant uh, day of campaigning as well. The updates that we are getting, Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath uh, is going to be uh, participating in public meetings today. Uh, the places that he's going to be in are uh, Muzaffarnagar and uh, Shamli. Uh, also, uh, Saharanpur is another district that uh, Yogi Adityanath would be campaigning. He's a star campaigner uh, for the BJP. Uh, the campaigners from the other parties uh, from the India Alliance are also spreading across uh, the length and breadth of the country. First phase of election campaigning is going to be in focus. Mm. You mentioned summers. Uh, mm. Well, the leaders also have to be careful about their tempers. We saw uh, show cause notices being issued by the election uh, commission to Congress leader Supriya Shinet also Dilip Ghosh uh, from West Bengal for their uh, statements. Uh, so in the summer season, while the leaders woo the voters, they'll have to be mindful of what they say and how. All right, Shubindu, we'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you for your thoughts. BJP National President J.P. Nadda appoints C.R. Keswin as national spokesperson of the party. Keswin, a former Congress leader from Tamil Nadu and a great grandson of first Indian Governor General C. Rajkupalachari, had joined BJP last year. And the Congress Party on Wednesday released its eighth list of 14 candidates for the upcoming parliamentary elections. The party has fielded Dolly Sharma from Ghaziabad, while Nakul Dube has been named as the Congress candidate from Sitapur in Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. In Telangana, Tati Parthi, Jeevan Reddy will contest from Nizamabad while Neelam Madhu has been named as the party's candidate from Medak in Telangana. In Jharkhand, Sukhdev Bhagat will contest from Lohar Daga while Jay Prakash Bhai Patel will contest from Hazaribagh. In Madhya Pradesh, party has fielded Pratap Bhanu Sharma from Vidisha. And BJP leader Jitin Prasad on Wednesday fielded filed his, in fact, nomination papers from Pilibit constituency in Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. BJP MLAs from all four assembly constituencies in Pilibit, Sanjay Gangwar, Babu Ram Paswan, Vivek Varma and Swami Prakashnand are the proposers in Prasad's nomination papers. Jitin Prasad has replaced party leader Varun Gandhi as the BJP candidate from the Pilibit constituency. An independent MP from Amravati, Navneet Rana, has joined BJP late on Wednesday night in presence of BJP State President Chandrasekhar Bhavan Kole. Navneet Rana will be contesting as a BJP candidate from Amravati Lok Sabha constituency. Rana said that she has been working on PM Modi ji's idols for the last many years and thanked Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Home Minister Amit Shah and BJP National President J.P. Nadda for nominating her from Amravati constituency. Now, conducting and regulating elections in a country of India's size is a herculean task. To ensure a seamless electoral process, the Election Commission appoints observers. Our next report tells you more about their duties. Conducting elections in a country with a population of over 1.4 billion is not an easy task. To ensure checks and balances in the electoral process, the Election Commission of India, the country's election regulator, appoints government officials as observers during polls to oversee the process and ensure fairness. They work under the ECI. The observers are divided into four categories, general, police, expenditure and counting. 
General and police observers oversee polling stations to make sure that they have necessary infrastructure, support and facilities. They also scrutinize candidates' nomination apart from ensuring effective implementation of the Model Code of Conduct, a set of guidelines laid down by the ECI for candidates contesting elections. Expenditure observers keep an eye on the book of accounts of candidates and monitor spending by them during campaigns. Currently, the expenditure limit for general election candidates in constituencies in bigger states is nearly $9 million, while for smaller states, it's $7 million. As the name suggests, counting observers supervise the counting process. Apart from their specific duties, observers also address grievances and complaints of the candidates related to the polling process. Their task involves submitting timely reports to the Election Commission, which can also be done using the poll body's observer portal. The contact details of observers are published in local newspapers so that the public can also approach them for any poll-related issues. Observers play a major role in boosting the confidence of the stakeholders by making the system more transparent. And the Delhi High Court has rejected Arvind Kejriwal's interim relief plea where the Delhi Chief Minister has questioned his arrest by the Enforcement Directorate in connection with the alleged excise policy scam. Instead, the court has issued notice to the Enforcement Directorate to respond to Kejriwal's petition by 3rd April. The court said it is mindful of the fact that whether the petitioner is entitled to immediate release or not, a decision on this will be based on the issues raised in the main petition. The Delhi CM was arrested by the ED on 21st of March. A Delhi court had remanded him to the probe agency's custody till Thursday. All right, let's cut across to DD India's Vikas Sarthi is joining us live. Uh, Vikas, uh, the agency's seven-day custody of Arvind Kejriwal expires and he'll be back in court where most likely uh, the authorities will ask for further custody. Right, Abhishek. In fact, uh, on the very first day, ED sought a custody of at least 10 days and then court uh, allowed custody uh, till 28th of, uh, 28th of March. So, uh, uh, if we go by the ED's version, ED, need, ED may need some more time to hmm. uh, to interrogate Arvind Kejriwal. Apart from it, we have we learned from the CBI sources that CBI has moved an application uh, for further custody of Arvind Kejriwal. Once the ED uh, informs the court that it doesn't it doesn't need uh, further inter invest interrogation from Arvind Kejriwal, then CBI will start investigating and uh, then. Uh, Arvind Kejriwal will have to respond to all those questions which CBI will pose to him. Uh, initially also, uh, you, if you recall, Abhishek, the case was registered by the CBI on complaint of Lieutenant Governor. Uh, so uh, the first FIR was registered by uh, CBI and uh, later, uh, later on ED joined the investigation to, uh, to honor the money trail. Uh, so uh, coming few weeks are quite tough for Arvind Kejriwal. Mm. Uh, first, we, he had to face the questions from the ED. Now he will have to face CBI. And later on also, uh, getting bail is not very easy in PMLA cases. Uh, there are strict conditions uh, when court grants bail to any accused. Uh, so it seems that for coming weeks, uh, Arvind Kejriwal may not get any kind of relief, either from the lower court and high court as well. As okay. you just mentioned that yesterday also, one of his petition was in fact, uh, denied by the High Court and uh, High Court will hear that petition on 3rd of April. Yesterday, his counsel argued that uh, they are challenging the uh, they are challenging the remand and the uh, ED custody. Uh, but uh, they, they, they sought that uh, another plea which demanded that he should be released immediately. They call it an, uh, uh, an unlawful custody by the ED. That petition should be listed urgently and court should decide it within one day. So that plea was opposed by the enforcement directorate and it said that it needs time to respond to these accusations. Now, on 3rd of, 3rd of April, High Court will continue uh, hearing that uh, that application filed by Arvind Kejriwal. Uh, but 
it seems that he may not get any kind of relief in coming weeks, Abhishek. All right, you're saying difficult days ahead for Arvind Kejriwal, like uh, in a big setback yesterday also, High Court denied interim relief to Arvind Kejriwal. And also, uh, Vikas, uh, Delhi High Court to hear PIL seeking removal of Arvind Kejriwal from CM's post? All right, Abhishek, this petition has been filed by one of a person who claims to be an activist and he hmm. said that Arvind Kejriwal cannot continue as chief minister since there are serious allegations against him. Particularly, these allegations are related to financial irregularities. So, he should not be allowed to continue as chief minister, though we have uh, uh, we, we, we have seen Aam Aadmi Party leaders, other ministers, uh, they were of the view that Arvind Kejriwal will continue as chief minister, whether he remains in, in jail or outside jail, that is irrelevant. But again, there are certainly some practical issues. Uh, it, it is quite impossible for a person to continue as chief minister while inside the lockup. So how he will uh, hold cabinets, how, he'll, how he will issue certain directions which are needed to be passed by chief minister uh, from time mm. to time, those are practical issues. Though as far as the legal bar is concerned, there is not clear cut legal bar uh, on a person unless he is convicted by a court for any crime where the sentence is, uh, is more than two years. So uh, that is the legal position, but practical issues are certainly there and it, he, Arvind Kejriwal may not continue as Chief Minister mm. because of those issues. All right, uh, Vikas, we'll leave it at that. Thank you for your inputs. All right, we'll slip into another short break, but still to come on this edition of DD India News Hour. In IPL, Sunrisers Hyderabad crush Mumbai Indians at Hyderabad Run Fest. In a world that never stops, where information shapes our reality, one app stands out, helps you stay ahead of time. Introducing the DD India app, your gateway to a world of news right at your fingertips. Your most trusted source of news goes global, goes digital. Explore a world of options, top stories, live updates, in-depth analysis and more. Stay informed wherever you are. Real-time alerts keep you ahead of the curve always. The DD India app connecting you to the world one story at a time. Download now and explore the world of knowledge, insights and authentic information. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. Hour. I'm Abhishek Mahajan. India has strongly objected to the remarks of the U.S. State Department spokesperson about certain legal proceedings in India. In a statement, India's Ministry of External Affairs said, In diplomacy, states are expected to be respectful of the sovereignty and internal affairs of others. This responsibility is even more so in case of fellow democracies. It could otherwise end up setting unhealthy precedents. India's legal processes are based on an independent judiciary which is committed to objective and timely outcomes. Casting aspersions on that is unwarranted. On Wednesday, U.S. Acting Deputy Chief of Mission Gloria Barbena was summoned by the Ministry in Delhi. The meeting lasted for approximately 45 minutes. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. Ajay Shankar is in Malaysia on the final leg of his three-nation visit to Southeast Asian nations, which also included visiting Singapore and the Philippines. The minister addressed the Indian community in Kuala Lumpur on Wednesday, appreciating their contribution to strengthening India-Malaysia relations. He also met the country's top leadership during the day. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar on the final leg of his three-nation Southeast Asian visit was in Malaysia on Wednesday. Addressing the Indian community in Kuala Lumpur, Dr. Jai Shankar appreciated the contribution of the Indian diaspora in the development of Malaysia. He said that India-Malaysia relations are being taken to the next level. India and Malaysia, we are poised uh, to take our relationship to the next level. I think very serious conversations are happening among policymakers to that end. But... Uh, anything like this requires the full support of society, uh, especially in countries where we have this kind of living bridge uh, between us. Uh, all of you, in some way or the other, can contribute to it. 
in your particular professions, in your walk of life, you can also make a difference adding to this relationship. And that is why you have seen uh, today how open we are, uh, how appreciative we are uh, of the contribution of the diaspora. Wednesday also saw Dr. Jay Shankar calling on the country's Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. During the meeting, the minister conveyed the greetings of Prime Minister Narendra Modi to him and appreciated the Malaysian leader's vision for stronger India-Malaysia ties. The minister further noted that he benefited from PM Ibrahim's guidance and insights on regional developments. Dr. S. Jay Shankar began his visit by meeting Malaysian counterpart Mohammad Haji Hassan earlier on Wednesday. Tuesday saw India's external affairs minister reiterating India's support for upholding the sovereignty of the Philippines at a joint news conference with his Filipino counterpart. I take this opportunity to firmly reiterate India's support to the Philippines for upholding its national sovereignty. As the world changes, it is essential that countries like India and the Philippines cooperate more closely to shape the emerging order. Overall, the External Affairs Minister's visit to Southeast Asian nations of Singapore, Philippines and Malaysia underscores India's efforts for regional stability and security, shaping the geopolitical landscape of the region. Bureau Report, DD India. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar concluded his three-nation tour to Southeast Asia, including Singapore, Philippines and Malaysia. Earlier, Dr. Ajay Shankar met Malaysia's Digital Minister Gobind Singh Deo. Both the leaders discussed digital cooperation, including exchange of best practices and business opportunities. Dr. Ajay Shankar was on a visit to Singapore from March 23rd to 25th, to Philippines from March 25th to 26th, and to Malaysia from March 27th to 28th. And the 29th meeting of the Working Mechanism for Consultation and Coordination on India-China Border Affairs was held on Wednesday in Beijing. Both India and China had an in-depth exchange of views on how to achieve complete disengagement and resolve the remaining issues along the line of actual control in the western sector of India-China border areas. In the interim, both sides agreed to maintain regular contact through diplomatic and military channels and on the need to uphold peace and tranquility on the ground in the border areas in accordance with existing bilateral agreements and protocols. The National Day of Greece was celebrated in Delhi. A dinner was hosted by the Ambassador of Greece to India. The chief guest on this occasion was the Indian Minister of State for External Affairs, Minakshi Lekhi. DD India correspondent Vishal Barstow spoke exclusively to the Greek Ambassador and the Indian Minister. Egypt and India, two great civilizations, two great democracies. And I have with me the ambassador of Greece to India. Also joining her is the union minister. Uh, let's first talk to the ambassador. When we talk about centuries of relationship between the two countries, what do you have to say? It's a relationship that is going on for centuries, contacts, uh, friendship between our two people. And uh, this year was a very special year. We had a visit of Honorable Prime Minister Modi to Greece and the visit of our Prime Minister in India. So the, the relation and the interaction goes on and is becoming stronger and deeper. Uh, Ambassador, you've also started UPI. Yes. India's initiative and India has been, Prime Minister Modi has been, you know, it has been his vision as far as digital transaction is concerned. So what do you have to say on that? It's an amazing uh, tool that I hope that Greece will integrate very soon. So uh, there is, was a first uh, memorandum sign and uh, we're looking forward to the future. We also have uh, the Minister of State for External Affairs. Ma'am, uh, what an opportunity to great civilizations celebrating the National Day. Absolutely. It's, uh, I think I'm very, I have had the proud privilege of being present on an occasion like this, especially with our friends, uh, not from recent past, but ancient past. And the uh, relationship between the two countries goes back to 2,500 plus years. And I must say that uh, uh, mention of Yavanas is uh, in all our literature, including uh, 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 Patanjali and Panini. So uh, all these references 
ensure that the two civilization and its people came together. Uh, we bring the prosperity to everyone and we wish the best to our Greek friends. Well, absolutely, Ambassador, wishing you a very, very happy National Day. And much. there you heard uh, both the leaders and uh, India and Greece growing stronger and stronger. With cameraman Aniket in Delhi, this is Vishal Baristo for DD India. The Japanese yen fell to a 34-year low of 151.97 against the dollar on Wednesday and monetary authorities held an emergency meeting to discuss the weakening currency. On Wednesday, Bank of Japan, the Finance Ministry and Japan's Financial Services Agency held a meeting late in Tokyo trading hours on Wednesday and suggested they were ready to intervene in the market. The yen has continued to lose ground despite the Bank of Japan's ending eight years of negative interest rates last week, making a landmark shift away from its focus on reflating growth with decades of massive monetary stimulus. And Japan markets opened lower on Thursday as the yen recovered slightly against the US dollar after slipping to a 34-year low a day earlier. The benchmark Nikkei 225 stock index dropped 1.08% in early hours of trading. The yen has continued to lose ground despite a historic shift away from negative interest rates by the Bank of Japan last week. Sports updates now will start with IPL. Sunrisers Hyderabad hit the highest total in Indian Premier League history, posting 277 for three against the Mumbai Indians. They sealed a 31-run victory in a power-hitting match that left bowlers on both sides clueless. Hyderabad surpassed the previous record of 263 for five set by Royal Challengers Bangalore in 2013. And talking about Thursday's games, Rajasthan Royals will clash with Delhi Capitals in Jaipur. Rajasthan Royals won their first game by defeating Lucknow Super Giants by 20 runs. Royals will be keen on maintaining their winning run. Rajasthan Royals under Sanju Samson has been one of the most formidable teams on paper. On the other hand, Delhi Capitals lost their first game of the tournament to Punjab Kings. And Delhi Capitals led by Rishabh Pant, who returned to cricket pitch after his horrific accident back in December 2022, will aim for its first win this season. All right, that's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X Formed, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Abhishek. From all of us here in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour.